Good afternoon. Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to extend a cordial welcome to you at the opening ceremony of the 28th annual meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists organized by the Otvas Lorand University in collaboration with the Hungarian National Museum and the Varkapitányság Nonprofit ZRT. Please let me introduce myself. My name is Bence Sós. I am curator and archaeologist of the Hungarian National Museum and the doctoral candidate of the Otvas Lorand University. And this afternoon, it is my honor and pleasure to be the moderator of this opening ceremony. I am privileged to greet at the ceremony Mr. Janos Csák, Minister of Culture and Innovation. <laughs> Dr. László Borhi, Rector of the Ötvös Lorand University. <laughs> Mr. László El Simon, General Director of the Hungarian National Museum. Dr. Gábor Virágos, Deputy Director General of Archaeology of the Hungarian National Museum. And Dr. Esther Banfi, President of the European Association of Archaeologists. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to, our, to the organizers of the conference, to all of our guests who accepted our invitation, to all members and to the representatives of the press. If you take a glance just behind me, you can see the Pro Musica mixed score of the Institute of Arts Communication and Music of the Ötvös Lorand University. The mixed score was established in 1984. In recent decades, the core received acclaim both on Hungarian as well as on interna international stages at several festivals and contests. The performance will set this opening ceremony into a frame, so to speak. In the following minutes, they are per performing two pieces. First, the so-called Nagyszombat Anthem, the anthem of the Ötvös Lorand University. The piece originated in the times when the university moved from Nagyszombat to the Strunova in Slovakia to Buda. The conductor is Associate Professor Ákos Erdős. are performing uh, Béla Bartók's Romanian folk dances, except from 
Villa Bartók's Romanian folk dances. Bartók composed this piece for the piano in 1915. Uh, due to its popularity, there are several versions of this piece. According to George Kroos, a companion to Bartók, only those who had the chance to enjoy the Romanian folk dances of Transylvanian villages in their native setting can truly understand how Bartók's adaptation in the concert hall captures the wholeness and richness of traditional life. The performance of the core is accompanied by Zsófia Simon on the trumpet and Zsófia Chasny on the piano. Both of them are former students of the Institute of uh, Arts Communication and Music, and the conductor is once again Ákos Erdős.
ladies and gentlemen, Zsófia Simon and Zsófia Chasni and the Pro Musica Mix Score. After this wonderful performance, I would like to give the floor to Alexandra Anders, chair of the local organizing committee, and ask her to give, the, give her opening speech. Good afternoon. Welcome. It's my sincere heartfelt pleasure to welcome you in Budapest for the opening ceremony of the EA 28th annual meeting. I'm also immensely honored to be the first to welcome you all on behalf of the local organizing committee, together with my fellow organizers, David Bartusz from the Atwesh Florent University and Sylvia Fabian and Esther Kreiter from the Hungarian National Museum. To the to host institution of the annual meeting. We hope to give all members of EAA a taste of the best Hungarian hospitality, offering the very best of ourselves to our guests and to friends, both old and new in our community. We feel responsible for your well-being as long as you stay under our roof, and we hope to provide a venue for the reintegration of our networks connections, and shared knowledge in order to prepare and be ready for new challenges now and in the future. I believe I'm not the only one to have awaited and longed for this moment for so long. Am I? We are now living in a constantly shifting, strange new world replete with new challenges. And it seems to me that this non-normality non will remain the norm for some time to come. We are currently going through an extremely difficult period full of challenges and changes, and both our personal lives and professional activities are increasingly affected by countless circumstances. Political changes, pandemics, wars, climate change, to name but a few. Yet, even this cloud has its silver lining. It was the COVID pandemic that provided the exceptional opportunity to again host the AM in Budapest after the 2020 online meeting. During these difficult times, it's particularly comforting to draw both strengths and inspiration from the experiences of past societies as uncovered by archaeology from the traditions of our centuries-old institutions and from the power represented by the EAA community spanning borders and generations. It's our hope that EAA 2022 Budapest will be an intellectually rewarding experience for all participants arriving from some 60 countries and will provide fresh inspiration for your work alongside offering novel cultural flavors and being an unforgettable meeting, both for those present here with us and for those participating online. We would again take the opportunity to express our very special thanks to the EAA office in Prague. Organizing an AM would have been impossible without their professionalism and active support. Similarly, we are most grateful to Altagra PCO and its staff for the organization of the EAA 2022 Budapest AM and for making our dream come true. 
We are genuinely pleased to see you all in Budapest, the city famed across land and sea, terra mari urbem notam, as phrased by the 17th century students of our university in the song you have just heard. And we hope you will enjoy yourselves and retain pleasant memories of your stay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Anders. Now I, I would like to respectfully request Mr. Janusz Czak, Minister of Culture and, and Innovation, to give his speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great privilege to be here, distinguished guests. Warm welcome to all of you who are not living here in Budapest, in our nation's capital, a city of rich past, vibrant presence, present, and hopefully bright future. We Hungarians, we live here in the Carpathian Basin for more than 1,100 years. We all know that nations and peoples are born, they rise, decline, or even disappear. Historians and archaeologists know that several factors influence the chances of survival, such as climate, geography, demography, and so on. I think the most important factor is culture. Obviously, what can I say as a minister of culture and innovation? <laughs> but seriously, culture is, in my book, is a way of life, a way of thinking. It's a mindset. Culture is as much material as intellectual and spiritual. Long-lasting social entities have the ability to comprehend the world and the human condition in it and their own life in it. But understanding is just not enough. Successful social entities are able to organize their life world. Even more, constituted social entities have a comprehensive religious, political, philosophical, artistic, and scientific reflection of the world and their position in it. This is where I see the greatest added value of archaeologists and historians. Because you provide the tangible evidence on how people lived, how they emerge, how they develop, but also how they fall and disappear. And if we are clever enough here and now in the 21st century, we can learn many lessons on how to avoid mistakes and how to live a good life in a unity of order. Actually, this is what we try to do, we Hungarians here in the Carpathian Basin, for more than 1,100 years now. We love our freedom and liberties. We have to be very rational when weighing dangers and chances of history. And hence, this is how we became survivors. Survivors in the midst of the thunders, thunderstorms of history. And as I mentioned, this place is just on the crossroads of peoples and nations. And this is why I warmly welcome you and I'm really happy to, to have you here because we are happy to share our heritage. And I, I really hope that besides the conference, you will be able to walk around and uh, 
and taste the Hungarian way of thinking, the Hungarian way of life on the streets of Budapest or, or even in the countryside. So to finally, on behalf of the Hungarian government, I wish you a really fruitful uh, conference, discussions, and also a pleasant stay here in our beloved capital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Chak. And now, please join me in welcoming the rector of the Ötvös Lorand University, Professor László Borhi. Dear Mr. Minister, Vice State Secretary, Madam President of EAA, Mr. Director General and Deputy Director General of the Hungarian National Museum, dear colleagues, dear participants. As the Rector of the University, I feel honored to welcome you on the occasion of that following many years of preparation, the annual General Assembly of the European Association of Archaeologists can finally begin its work in Budapest, the capital of Hungary, which even has been postponed for several years due to the recent pandemic. Welcome to our university. And right now, at the beginning of my speech, I would like to most sincerely wish you to spend the next few days in a useful and meaningful way from both scientific and cultural aspects as our guests. This event, to hosted by Hötvös Lund University, since its foundation in 1635, that is for nearly four centuries, and being for a long time the one and only university in Hungary, our institution has been increasingly and steadfastly at the service of science, education, culture, as well as innovation, lately by being a founding member of the European Institute of Innovation and Technologies, Culture and Creativity Innovation Community. Our similarly long-established partner institution, the Hungarian National Museum, founded in 1802, 20, uh, 220 years ago, as well as the Castel Headquarters Nonprofit LTD, an organization responsible for cultural heritage protection in Hungary, are co-organizers of the scientific session, the annual General Assembly of the European Association of, of uh, Archaeologists starting today. This is a special event for Hungarian archaeology, since although there were major conferences attracting a large internet, uh, international community to our country in the past decades, such as the 11th International Congress of Roman Frontier Studies in 1976, the 8th International Congress of Ancient Wall Painting, also hosted by our university in 2001, this is the first time in nearly 150 years that the European Archaeologist Association of Archaeologists, the significance of which goes even beyond the borders of Europe, is visiting our country again to have its scientific meeting here in Budapest. It was almost on the same day, on 4th September 1876, 146 years ago, that Agoston Trefort, Minister of Religion and Education, opened the Huitième Congrès International d'Anthropologie et Archéologie Préhistorique, co-organized by two prestigious scientific institutions, the Royal Hungarian University of Budapest and the Hungarian National Museum. The way the Sunday paper called Vasárnapi Újság, Sunday News in uh, English, reported on the Congress on 8 October 1876 is still relevant today. I quote it. Our domestic archaeology saw good days last September. Hundreds of experts from all over the civilized world gathered to attend the International Congress of Prehistoric Archaeology in Budapest. They were not even deterred by the war raging across our borders, nor could the hostile press of our neighbors discourage them from coming to our country, mocked as barbaric. We did not welcome our guests with pomp, and splendor. 
We were content to present the prehistoric monuments of our country to them and let them judge the value of our work themselves. Beyond that, due to the Congress, Hungary is no longer an unknown land to archaeologists of prehistory. The fault is aware that we have also been uh, working diligently in the field of uh, the discipline and that Hungarian archaeologists also contribute considerably to advancing this profession. All this was thanks to Floris Romer, head professor of the university's Department of Numismatics and Archaeology between 1868 and 1877, and curator of antiquities at the Hungarian National Museum from 1869. Our Department of Archaeology also has a history stretching far back into the past, as it was founded 245 years ago by Istvan Schönwiesner and had set such distinguished professor as Romer Flourish Price before, Andreas Alföldi and Andreas Mochi. Our current event is of similar importance to the one held in 1876. Being not only rector of the Utrechtland University but also a professor of Roman provincial archaeology and the supervisor of the excavations conducted in Roman Brigetio, I'm also proud to be involved in an event together with my colleagues, which mobilized the, uh, the 15,000 EAA members from over 60 countries and motivated 1,700 registered participants to attend in person or online and learn about the archaeology, history, and culture of Hungary. Today, not only leading and prominent representatives of European and international archaeology are present, but also younger researchers, career entrants, and university students who are the promise of the future. I'm indebted to Felipe Criado Boado and uh, Mrs. Esther Banfi, former and actual EA presidents, as uh, Mrs. Uh, Elzebeth Yerem for supporting Hungary's application for organizing this conference, as well as to the leaders and staff members of the Utrecht Lorand University, especially Al Alexandra Anders, David Bortus, and Emilia Ricker. The Hungarian National Museum, especially its former and actual general directors, uh, Benedek Varga and Laszlo L. Shimon, present uh, here, and the Castor Headquarters Nonprofit LTD for the organization. Finally, I would like to thank Janusz Czak, Minister of Culture and Innovation, for accepting our invitation, and just like his great predecessor, Agoston Trefort, Minister of Culture and Religion 146 years ago, he has not only enhanced the profile of the event with his personal presence and speech, but also demonstrated that the research and respect of the past is an important issue for the Hungarian government. I hope you will hear an enjoying lectures, have many fruitful discussions, get to know each other, Budapest and Hungary, and take us in your hearts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Borhi. Now I would like to give the floor to Gabor Virágos, Deputy Director General of Archaeology of the Hungarian National Museum. If you don't mind this way of moving. So, dear Mr. Minister, uh, dear Mr. Rector, Madam President, Director General, Vice State Secretary, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, now I only have a short speech. Uh, first of all, greeting you on behalf of the museum instead of the Director General is not an unpoliteness. Uh, as head of the National Institute of Archaeology of the museum, covering all the archaeological duties, I have the honor to represent the institution and be your host during this archaeological conference. Uh, I also warmly welcome you here in Budapest on behalf of both co-organizing partners of the university, the Hungarian National Museum and the Várkapitán Ság Zrt. The actual situation is that uh, the former archaeological and uh, scientific directorate of the Várkapitán Ság had been integrated into the National Museum in January 2022, so this year, so beyond the previous organizations, uh, we only have to say thank you to the Varkapitanshak for this venue site. Uh, 
this Far Bazaar, for which we are very, very grateful. As uh, most data and other relevant issues regarding the conference and its organization have been told before, let me call your attention only to one specific issue. The logo of the conference has been compiled from a decoration element of a jug of the Seuso treasure. Um, the original item you can see in the museum, along with the other 13 big size uh, silver vessels made in the fourth century. So come and see. And uh, the Hungarian National Museum is, of course, also honored to host the 28th annual meeting of the EAA, together with the Atvesloran University, to reintegrate the archaeologists and heritage experts of Europe and out of Europe. So in the name of all my colleagues, I would like to take the opportunity to express our very, very special thank to everybody who took part in organizing this uh, conference. It was really a huge workload. I also express our gratitude to all of you who arrived at Budapest, as traveling is really an issue nowadays. And of course, also to those ones who will follow the conference with the help of the internet. The museum will be your place for most highlight events and is open for you to visit its exhibitions. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or need any help in anything. Okay, <laughs> but most importantly, <laughs> ho hope it's not inside. But most importantly, the National Museum will host all the keynote speeches, except for uh, Dr. Bohi's speech coming right after here, and the official reception of the conference this evening. So hope to see you all soon in the museum garden, where I will greet you again, but in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Virágos. Now, please welcome the president of the European Association of Archaeologists, Dr. Esther Bánfi. Isten hozott benneteket Budapesten. Distinguished guests, colleagues, dear colleagues, Welcome everyone to our 28th EAA annual meeting in Budapest. This day is a festive one in several ways. First, we celebrate our first on-site meeting since 2019, a joyful occasion to catch up in person with all the things that are important to us. Second, this is the first fully hybrid meeting in EAA's history, and we intend to continue like this in the future. Our goal is to invite everyone to continue to meet face to face, especially after such a long time of separation and isolation, but also to expand the invitation to those who, for whatever reason, cannot travel. The fact that the overwhelming majority of attendees opted to be present in Budapest clearly evidences the shared desire to come together listen to each other's new ideas and shared results, research results, as well as renew networking, professional and social. But today, we are also celebrating two further things, and both have been already hinted upon. These are connected to our venue in Hungary. First, it needs to be borne in mind that the EAA staff and the scientific committee have carried out the huge task of organizing a meeting for us for the second time within two years. It was a real surprise to me when our local partners who ran the 2020 so-called online or virtual annual meeting declared themselves ready to take on the gigantic workload of organizing yet another annual meeting in 2022. An unprecedented challenge, of course but there might be an important reason behind their brave decision, which is my second point. This has also been mentioned shortly before, uh, a, a few minutes ago, but this is the fact that Hungarian archaeology has not witnessed substantial international meetings for 146 years since 1876, when then organized by the first Hungarian archaeologist, Floris Romer. 
The next planned large conference, the third Congress International des Sciences Préhistoriques et Protéhistoriques, was swept away by World War II, and the next attempt by the Stalinist circumstances with hermetically closed borders and the Iron Curtain. In 1955, after Stalin's death, even the presence of Wier Gordon Child and Wilhelm Unverzagt did not prove sufficiently persuasive to satisfy the international interest with a large conference. And as the last week of this bad fate, it happened that in the first year of the COVID pandemic in 2020, Budapest, the EAM had to be turned to an online meeting. Hungarian archaeologists felt unanimously that this series of unfortunate circumstances simply had to be broken. Hence the commitment to make a real and large Budapest meeting. And I'm happy to say that this meeting has already begun. As you might have noticed, our current conference logo, Reintegration, symbolizes all the aspects of recovery from the pandemic and of overcoming isolation, but also speaks to Hungary's archaeological misfortunes, the overcoming of these misfortunes over the last 150 years. About the other content of the logo, we have just uh, heard from Gabor Viragos that is also a very important uh, symbolic uh, content. It has been a busy year, with a new code and principles, a huge workload for a task force, a theme that also shaped the EAA statement for this year. We started to implement our strategic plan from last year. Importantly, this involves the establishment of advisory committees that help expand the knowledge and experience of the board, which will appreciate the support drawn from a wider membership. The work of these committees will start in September and will also enhance the cooperation with our communities, which, to our great pleasure, play an increasingly active role in EIA's professional life. Our annual meeting with nearly 200 sessions, keynote lectures, and almost 1,700 speakers with more than 2,000 contributions carries the promise of an exciting and extremely busy three days ahead a strong signal of our membership to become integrated, indeed. And Budapest, as a city, can offer you, along with natural beauty, an extremely positive archaeological experience, as the Danube cuts Budapest into a hilly Pannonian Roman area and a flat step apart, certainly only regarded by the Roman Empire as barbaricum. Both geographically and culturally, the Danube played a dividing role over millennia of prehistory. The flat Alford belonged to Southeast Europe, while Transdanubia in the West was part of the Central European social and cultural processes. The turbulent centuries before and after the Hungarian tribes arrived in the Carpathian Basin, followed wars, conflicts, uprising, freedom fights, and oppressions that filled the second millennium AD. Some overarching themes of this year resonate with the Carpathian Basin as a zone for mobility and transit for millennia. Beyond thanking our staff, the scientific committee, and all Hungarian colleagues, I'd like to highlight yet another group without whom our annual meeting could not be successful. Our young volunteers. These students are engaged with logistics, help us orientate ourselves during the events. They are present in each session and roundtable, ready to intervene and support us when necessary. We are grateful to them for all this. However, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that these young people will become part of the EAA membership. They are our upcoming colleagues, perhaps leaders of the next generation. When gratefully accepting their help these days, we should see EAA's future in them. As archaeologists, we are well aware that we cannot move to the future without acknowledging the past. At this time, I propose a moment of silence in acknowledgement of the EAA members we have lost in this last year, among them Caroline Wickham Jones and Deborah Nichols. Newton is credited with saying, if I have seen further, 
It is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. If we are to see further, it is because we build further upon the research, academic rigor, and spirit of inquiry of those who have gone before. As we move onward in time, how we, re uh, well, in the, uh, we, we should relate to our shared human past as well as our past as a discipline has changed. Our TEA, the European Archaeologist, the EAS newsletter, is currently sponsoring a photojournalism contest for their newly instituted covers on this very theme. What is the spirit of archaeology in 2023? For full rules, please see the EAA webpage before the final due date on the 9th of September. In continuation of such new directions for the EAA, I'm also happy to announce that EAA is officially beginning with its um, book award program. This book award program is a brand new thing and you will know more about this uh, during the conference. Details will be announced about it uh, and are already uh, to be reached in the web and it will be also circulated by emails to members. However, let's now see how are the re recipients of the existing EAA prizes and awards. So I am looking for the awards, the prizes, and let us hear who is first to announce them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. As mentioned, it is now time to acknowledge some of the remarkable achievements of our fellow archaeologists. First, the presentation of the European Archaeological Heritage Prize. And to do that the honours, I would like to invite Mary Louise Stig Sorensen, Chair of the EAA Heritage Prize Committee, to join me on the stage. I think <clears throat> this is as near as I would ever be to a feeling of participating in the Oscars. <laughs> it may be as near as the rest of you will be as well. It's an important event. And I'm very honored on behalf of the committee to announce first the award for in the individual category. So the EAA Committee for the European Archaeological Heritage Prize are being given in the individual category to Sofia Labarti. <laughs> and the justification for the prize, let me read. Beyond its cultural value, heritage has the potential to address many of the challenges that society faces. Sophia Labati has made this potential a reality of her work, both at an academic and a practical level. Scholarly, her publications are some of the essential readings in the field of heritage. In particular, her work has analyzed the working of UNESCO conventions about heritage and the role of museums and heritage sites in daily life. But even more importantly, together with her work in the field, her contribution has played a role in shaping policy and practice aimed at a more inclusive and fair environment. Addressing the role of women in heritage, for example, and the impact of good heritage practice for social justice. Her latest work focuses on the contribution of heritage to the Sustainable Development Goals. Confronting the marginal role that heritage usually has, she used her decade of work on shaping policy for the management of cultural heritage from an inclusive and in sustainable perspective that strengthens the role of local communities and benefit marginalized ones. All this was done while educating a new generation of professionals that bring these values to the core of their practice. For her commitment to improving practices in heritage management, for her valuable contribution to the field, and the impact of her work for inclusive and committed practices, Sophia Lubati is awarded 
the 2022 Individual Archaeological Heritage Prize of the European Association of Archaeology. Congratulations. Um, I'm very honored to receive this prize um, today. Um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Alan Swift from the University of Kent, who have nominated me, and of course, the jury for having selected um, the nomination. This prize is very important for me as I represent diverse types of diversity, including being from an Algerian background, so being African, um, and also coming from a very disadvantaged background. Yet, I'm very aware that all fields, the field of heritage and archaeology, is still very much excluding in terms of race, gender, class. And I very much hope that this prize that I got today will convince you all that diversity is a strength, and I look forward to hearing from you about the great future initiative on diversifying the field of heritage and archaeology. Herit uh, diversity is a strength, I think. Thank you very much for awarding me this prize. And we have one more. We also, as you hopefully all remember, have a prize for in the institutional category. And this year, it go to Avasa, IMAS, Engaging Youngsters in Cultural Heritage, OKIS one-on-one -on -one program. And I'm not sure if the representative, yeah, good. I will read the justification. So, Avasas IMAS, Engaging Youngsters in Cultural Heritage, UK's one-on-one -on -one program. Archaeological heritage seems to be inherently valuable and positive. However, communities react to it in very different ways, and does so depending on the type and location of site, types and location of sites. The mediating roles of professional is essential and the potential of archaeological sites to address important issues in contemporary society is crucial. The AVAS, Association for Furthering Value, Archaeology, and Ancient History, has implemented the UK's one-on-one -on -one education program to engage young, youngsters, 12 to 16 years old, from Italy, Greece, and Syria with the archaeological heritage in their vicinity. Besides the direct impact on learning and unexpected support of archaeological heritage protection, this program strengthens other important values or skills that help to build a more inclusive and creative society. For its work in shaping better global citizens through archaeological heritage, bridging the gap between regions and providing the potential of good education program to engage with social challenges, the vast IMAS is awarded the 2022 Institute of Archaeology, Institute Archaeological Heritage Prize of the European Association of Archaeology. Good evening, Budapest. Um, I am delighted to be here and accept this prize in the name of Federico Puccellati, the director of the Mozan Orkish Archaeological Project, who has been prevented, unfortunately, to come in person because of a personal emergency in the family. 
and in the name of all the people who give life and meaning to the project, in particular, Hiba Kassar, the director of the school program, Yasmin Mahmoud, who manages the project from Damascus, and Amir Ahmed, our, archaeological, uh, our archaeologist, who keeps everything going at the site. I am Arwa Kharoubi, and I'm also part of this unique project that has opened a bright ray of light in the darkness of the current Syrian situation and has become a beacon of how a remote archaeological past can become integrated and become to be felt as living heritage by all the communities that live around the site. It is a pride we too, the many archaeologists active in this project, deeply share. It gives us reason for a new sense of community of, to what we are doing as schoolers, to see how profoundly relevant the traces of life once lived and still live today. And for the young ones, as they gain a sense of who they are, not only as individuals, but as members of a community that thrives on shared memory. The recognition your prize give us also goes to the funding agencies that have made it possible for us to carry uh, on the project, of which we wish to remember in particular the Kaplan Fund, the Balzan Foundation, the Cariblo Foundation, and the Italian Foreign Ministry. They too share deeply in our pride. Thank you very much, everyone. Congratulations to the Everdees. We will proceed with the Oscar Montelius Foundation Early Career Achievement Prize. I would like to ask Aline Delen, president of the Oscar Montelius Foundation, to present the award. Daryl. On behalf of the Oscar Montelius Foundation, I'm honored to award this year's Early Career Achievement Prize. Before doing so, I would like to say that the idea of this prize is to encourage and value the work done by young archaeologists, whether you work in academia, a museum, in heritage management or contract archaeology. We urge you to keep up the important work you do and please Applications for next years to come are very welcome. Oscar Montelius Foundation trustees highly appreciate all the applications received for the Earlier Career Achievement Prize in 2022. Many of the applications are of high quality, where especially three were standing out. And in the end, we managed to make a decision. The Oscar Montelius Foundation trustees uh, award this year prize to the PhD student Constanze Schatke. And uh, I will now read the justification for the prize. Constanze Schatke is awarded the Early Career Achievement Prize 2022 on the grounds of the social innovation, interdisciplinarity and international impact of her early career work. Constanze Schatke is a young researcher working on osteological collections in museums. In her newly started PhD research, she is going to combine bioarchaeology with provenance to investigate violence in the acquisition context of human remains at the Natural History Museum in Vienna, especially during the period 1857 to 1935. The time span represents a period when many collections of looted human remains from indigenous and other groups were assembled by museums of Europe. The human remains were collected and studied in form of scientific traditions that are considered inappropriate in recent times. Ms. Schatke's Master of Science research involved in-depth provenance research on collections of human remains drawn from indigenous people from South America. 
The study of human remains can reveal important insights into the past and can provide previously unrevealed information even about each individual studied. As part of her work, Ms. Schottke has participated in the planning of the repatriation of human remains to Hawaii in 2022, together with an associate ceremony. Regarding indigenous Maori and Moriori human remains from New Zealand, in which she has recommended the repatriation of, col of a collection of more than 50 remains from people to their New Zealand community representatives. She is currently involved in preparation of associate repatriation ceremonies. Her work reveals a person who is inquisitive and fearless, as well as particularly sensitive. This is seen in the manner in which she has imparted the knowledge gained from her research on specific groups to the descendants of those populations and their communities of origin. She has demonstrated that she processes the insightful and ethically appropriate approach needed in the pursuit of her work and in her communication with the descendant communities of the collection she is working with. Social impact. Ms. Schatke has established, established contact with descendant community organizations, such as the Coipacion Selkem Chile and Fondacion Hak Saya. She specifically learned and improved her Spanish in order to communicate directly with the indigenous descendants of the human bone collection she has studied. The Selknam are currently in the process of gaining recognition as indigenous people from the Chilean state. The knowledge of the, de of the descendants and the international community about the bones of the Selknam in Vienna gives them back a part of their cultural identity and empowers them in the fight against extinction. Innovative impact. Ms. Schatke was the first person from the Natural History Museum to proactively search for and seek contact with communities of descendants whose bones are curated in one of the biggest collections of human remains in Europe. Interdisciplinary impact. Ms. Schatke's research is generally characterized by an interdisciplinary approach. She combines bioarchaeological and forensic methods with research results from archival and historical sources within the Vienna Natural History Museum and in other institutions and libraries in Vienna and abroad. In doing so, she reconstructs a detailed provenance history and creates an individual biography or personal details for each individual. Some results of her master thesis are prepared for publication and are currently under peer review. Two different papers written in collaboration with representatives from the indigenous Chilean groups will shed light on different perspectives of colonialism, the significance of human remains to the indigenous people, re-individualization and appropriate management of sensitive collection of human remains. International impact. Provenance research and the scientific history of anthropological collections is a field in need for intensified cross-cultural collaboration. Ms. Schatke's work contributes to the decolonization of archaeology and museum collections by exploring the extent to which colonial and racist stereotypes were reproduced through the acquisition exhibition and anthropological analysis of the collections concerned. The article on this issue will be part of an anthology on colonial collections of Museum of Austria to be published in 2023. In view of the above, Constanze Schatke can be considered an outstanding early career archaeologist fulfilling all selection criteria and she is awarded the 2022 Early Career Achievement Prize of Oscar Montelius Foundation. Constance Schatke, please come to the floor.
Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Ellen. Um, it's been a pleasure so far for me to be here in Budapest. Um, I'm a first year PhD student at the Natural History Museum Vienna. What doesn't just make me a scientist early into her career, but also a member of how me and my peers call ourselves um, the so-called um, pandemic generation of young scientists. We are used to online conferences, uh, talks and sessions, so it's really nice to see what all the fuss about in-person conferences is like. Uh, is like, and let me just say that I'm intrigued uh, with everything that I experienced so far, which is, of course, totally unbiased opinion that I would have also had had if I would have not received this amazing uh, early career achievement prize today. So regarding this prize, I would like to thank my PhD supervisor, Sabina Eggers, as well as Margit Berner from the museum, the staff at the Department of Anthropology for creating this welcoming environment where I've been able to conduct my research since the first day I stepped foot into the building, especially also to our head, um, Dr. Karen Wilczke Schrotter. But I would also like to thank um, two outstanding and exceptional women, namely Fernanda Olivares Molina and Emani Molina Vargas, without whom I would probably also not be standing here today either. Um, Fernanda and Emani belong to the mentioned Selkman people who live in Tierra de Fuego in Chile. In my master thesis, I was able to work with them on researching the origins of these indigenous human remains uh, of people from their tribe. This has sustainably impacted my interest as a, or research interest as a bioarchaeologist and anthropologist in the direction of how to deal with these sensible osteological collections. Um, indigenous heritage in general and ethics regarding the handling and storing of human remains. And I'm honored and pleased that the, this kind of work is being acknowledged this evening by the EAA. Um, reconstructing the past, the main task or one of the main tasks of archaeology and anthropology can only be successful if we bring all stakeholders to the table, researchers, um, descendants, indigenous people, even in uncomfortable contexts that I experienced, or uh, not that I experienced, but that I researched. So thank you very much again, and I can't wait for the conference to start. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations to the winner. Now it is time to present the EAA Student Award. I would like to give the floor to Kate Freeman, editor of the European Journal of Archaeology. Uh, presenting the Student Award is a very exciting thing for me because the last two years this has been online and the time zones have not let me participate in person, so this is my first time doing it. Uh, and the Student Award judging process is probably my favorite part of the year. There's nothing more exciting than reading the research of the rising generation of archaeologists. Uh, the European Association of Archaeologists instituted the EA Student Award in 2020, uh, 2002. Excuse me. Uh, the prize is awarded annually for the best paper presented by a student or archaeologist working on a dissertation at the EA annual meeting, and the papers are evaluated for their academic merit and innovative ideas by the Student Award Committee. Before I announce the award winner, I want to acknowledge and warmly congratulate two honorable mentions, and these were in fact two of the um, earliest career archaeologists, earliest in their studies archaeologists who submitted papers this year. So honorable mentions and warm congratulations to uh, Guillermo Pulido for his paper, The Distribution of Greek Pottery in the Middle Valley of Wadiana River in the Wake of the Last Archaeological Research, and also to uh, Mikofai Dobek for Button, an Inconspicuous Indicator of Industrialization. Congratulations to the two of them. And uh, the European Association of Archaeologists very pleased to award the 2022 Student Award to uh, Paloma Coelho del Pozo for her paper, Who, Why, and When? Peopling of the Canary Islands and the Challenges of Archaeometry. And to read the Laudatio for it. Archaeology is uniquely interdisciplinary, spanning the arts and sciences in equal measure. Scientific analysis plays an important role in our research, 
But the results of archaeometric studies can only be understood within the complex framework of human society, historical process, and taphonomy. In her paper, Who, Why, and When, Peopling of the Canary Islands and the Challenges of Archaeometry, Paloma Cuelo del Pozo uh, examines the affordances of various archaeometric data sets to elucidate the initial occupation of the Canary Islands. Cuello del Pozo presents a critical review of the research, both historical and scientific, regarding the initial migration of people into the Canaries. She grounds this research in nisology, the study of islands on their own terms, and uses interpretative tools drawn from uh, sociobiogeography to frame her reevaluation of proposed settlement models and the variety of new scientific data, from DNA to dates brought to bear on them. She explores how these different data have been applied to argue variably for a Mediterranean or an African origin for the archipelago's original inhabitants, and highlights where different types of analysis tell the same story of migration or contradict each other. Her critique makes clear that simply adding more data and more scientific approaches will not suffice to answer questions about complex human behaviors, such as migration and early island colonization. Cuello del Pozo concludes with a reflection on the proposed third science revolution, uh, which has been much debated in archaeology in recent years. While she enthusiastically embraces archaeometric analysis, she reminds us that our scientific data are only as valid as the methods used to collect and record analyzed samples and the humanist models that allow us to interpret them in light of complicated past worlds. We congratulate Paloma del, uh, Cuello del Pozo and look forward to the publication of her paper. Please come up. Good evening, everybody. This is super exciting. <laughs> As a last year PhD student, and um, and really just, it's a really vibrant moment. I, all, all the words I have is just thank you. Thank you to the committee, the European Association of Archaeologists Committee that found my paper worthy of this award. Um, I also want to thank especially Dr. Helen Dawson. Probably without her guidance, I wouldn't be here today in this conference. In addition, I want to give special thanks to my supporters, to the foundations and the organizations that support my research. It's a very exciting moment as a Canary Islander studying out, out um, in the United States. Um, it's a really, really amazing opportunity for me to be studying the people where I come from uh, with the help of international agencies. In addition, I want, to help, I want to thank my department, Department of Anthropology at Texas A&M University and my university, Texas A&M, because they go above and beyond for their students, and they certainly have helped for me to be here today. And most especially, I want to dedicate this uh, prize to my advisor, my PhD advisor, Dr. Lori Wright, professor at, um, in anthropology at Texas A&M University because she is an amazing human being and she has helped me not only become, she's helping me become uh, a good scholar but also um, a good human being. So just thank you. Yeah. Congratulations to the winner. Finally, I would like to ask the president of the European Association of Archaeologists, Esther Bamfi, to once again join me on the stage and present the honorary membership of the European Association of Archaeologists. EAA has a handful of honorary members and even less female honorary members. It is thus our great pleasure to today we shall launch a long-standing colleague of us who happens to be a lady. Erzsi Betjerem, born in Budapest in 1942, spent almost all her career in the Archaeological Institute of the then Hungarian Archaeology of Sciences. And meanwhile, she has been founding member and managing director of the Archaeolingua Foundation for more than 30 years, 
a publishing house that produced and produces a large number of excellent volumes on European archaeology. She has been committed, a committed member of EAA since the beginnings. In 1996, she became vice president, but she also served outside of the executive board in various positions like the nomination committee or the EGA editorial board membership. In 2014, she was awarded the EAA European Archaeological Heritage Prize. Archaeolingua has been sponsoring the student award since its foundation. Beyond this longstanding service, Erjebet has always been keen to use her immensely broad international network to develop RNH or heritage themes, teaching, helping, and supporting many colleagues of the young or now not so very young anymore generation. She turned 80 this year, and it is our great delight to award her the EAA honorary membership. We would have pleased to invite her to stage to receive her diploma. Unfortunately, Erjibet cannot be with us today as she was tested positive, COVID positive. She is, however, following, according to my greatest hopes, following the opening ceremony online. So please give a big applause to her. Congratulations, Erjibet, and we wish you a quick recovery. And here I promise you and I promise all that we shall catch up with this. Thank you, Madam President, and we wish a quick recovery for the uh, very And this concludes the presentation of awards. Now it is time for the keynote lecture of this opening ceremony. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Blaslo Borhi, Rector of the Ötvöslor and University, and I would like to ask him to give his lecture. Okay. Dear Madam President, dear participants, dear colleagues, this uh, paper is based on my book published uh, uh, 2015 in Germany, the Römer in Ungarn, in Darmstadt, later in Hungarian and also in French language, but not in English. Pannonia covered the territory of several present-day states. Its southern part belongs to today's Slovenia, Croatia, and Serbia. A narrow strip in the west falls on the territory of Austria, while in the north, south of uh, Pozhony, Bratislava, a small section forms part of present-day Slovakia. However, the core area of the former province of Pannonia belongs to today's uh, Western Hungary, and covers the entire territory of Transdanubia, significant section of which is bordered by the river Danube in a length of uh, 420 kilometers as border uh, Limas or Ripa of the Roman Empire. In this central area, so important historical events took place over the 500 years of Roman rule, which entitled us to discuss Hungary's Roman history on its own. As early as the age of the Roman Republic, the works of Greek and Latin authors tell about a group of people of uh, Illyrian, Illyrian origin, collectively called them Pannonioi in Greek language, who lived between and beyond the rivers Drava, Dravus, and Sava, Savus, in the south of Pannonia. Although some stereotypes 
such as the image of Pannonians living scattered in the mountains, namely the Alps, survive, survived to the late second century AD. Additionally, other topoi that also provide to be a rather long life emerged as well. Pliny the Elder, for example, referred to the corn-bearing Pannonia in the Glandifera Pannonia, uh, that is a land covered with oak forests, uh, which became a general idea persisting until late antiquity. A fairly accurate description of the region is known from the time of the Flavians, second half of the first century AD, which reflects a surprisingly profound knowledge of the Romans, Romans about the geography, hydrography, and ethnic compositions of the area. Pliny the Elder mentions two provinces in Illyricum, and the, he continues to use this name for the region in a purely geographical sense rather than an administrative one. These provinces are Dalmatia, and the south of Pannonia on the north, adjacent to Noricum, including the gentle foothills of the Alps, it's a quotation from antic authors, and bordered by the course of the Danube. In addition, the naming the Danube, Danuvius, he also mentions Lake Balaton, Lacus Perso, and two major rivers, nam namely the Sava, Savus, with its uh, in the tributaries, the Cupa Colpa Colapis, and the Bosu Bacuntius, as well the Dravus Drava. At the first sight, the history of the conquest of Pannonia seems completely clear and unproblematic because we have an account of this event by no less a personage than Emperor Augustus himself. In his Res Gaste Divi Augusti, which records the deeds of the divine, divine Augustus as a ruler, the emperor describes the conquest of Pannonia, or rather the peoples of Pannonia, as follows, uh, I quote it, the Pannonian peoples, whom the army of the Roman people had never approached before, I was the leading citizen, were conquered through the agency of Tiberius Nero, who was then my stepson and legate. I brought them into the empire of the Roman people and extended the frontier of Illyricum to the banks of the Danube. The translation is from Brandt and Moore, 1969. This would imply that the Romans conquered the areas between the Drava and the Danube as well. However, there is no evidence of this at all. Between the reigns of Emperor Augustus and Claudius, we hardly or only sporadically have information about finds that would suggest permanent Roman presence along the future frontier formed by, formed by the Danube or even in the interior of the later province of Pannonia. The frontier was extended to the Danube at the same time when the two other major rivers in the west and the north, namely the Elbe, Albis, and the Rhine, Renus, became the borders of the Roman Empire. With these measures, Rome meant to secure the newly conquered provinces north of the Alps by making the Rhine and the Danube, the two largest rivers in Europe, not only parts of the frontier but also waterways to be used as means for travel and transport. However, to be able to access these rivers located at a great distance from Italy, Rome needed to take possession of the water courses leading to them, as well as the surrounding areas. In the case of Pannonia, this policy can be interpreted in a way that the term the banks of the Danube refers exclusively to the section of the Danube stretching between the confluences of the Danube and its uh, tributaries, the Drava and Sava in the east. Also, the name Illyricum uh, continued to be used for the entire region in the geographic and uh, administrative sense of the word. There is evidence that the territory was officially divided into two parts. The southern part of the province, which lay closer to Rome and was therefore the upper, upper area being wide, uh, viewed from uh, they started to be called Illyricum Superius, that is Upper Illyricum as is uh, evidenced by an epigraphic source. The lower part of the province lying further away from Rome, that is, the northern area, must have been called Illyricum Inferius. Sometime later, these two regions received their own official old new names. From that time on, the southern area was called Dalmatia, Dalmatia also evidenced by early geographic literature, while the northern area was named Pannonia. 
It was relatively late, perhaps uh, sometime during the reign of Emperor Nero, between uh, 54 and 68 AD, that the official name Pannonia emerged for the first time. In any case, based on our current knowledge, the first governor of the province known by the names was Lucius Tampius Flavianus, sorry, uh, who was mentioned in an Italian inscription during the reign of Emperor Vespasianus. The Shortly, uh, and this is a military diploma from the age of uh, Vespasianus mentioning the province uh, Pannonia. Shortly after Rome conquered the new territory, the process of the administrative, administrative organization uh, would start, which uh, meant the establishment of civitatis, Roman administrative units, gentis, supplement units based on uh, families, and centuriae. The territory of Pannonia was subjected to military control. This statement equally applies to the immediate surroundings of the military forts and the settlement areas of the tribes. Although Pannonia was still considered a province conquered by arms, whose inhabitants didn't have Roman civil rights, they were free people, peregrine, of the province and as such full citizens of their own communities. The new administrative units of the free indigenous population of the province, Civitatis Peregrinae, which we see on the picture, came under military control. The respect, uh, respective uh, ethnic groups were subjected to the authority of the commanders of military units stationed caused that to them, namely the high-ranking officials, prefecti of the infantry units, cohortes, or cavalry units, ally. When giving the position and name of these military commanders, their military rank was always indicated, so it is known that there were predominantly Roman knights in the rank of prefectus cohortis or prefectus ally, but occasionally there were also centurions among them. Furthermore, the military units, for instance, the cohorts uh, uh, Prima Noricor mentioned uh, here, commanded by them was also mentioned together with the name of the tribes of Peregnus Tetus, whose supervision was entrusted to them. For instance, prefectus of both civitates, uh, or that of the Boi and that of the Azali mentioned in this inscription. The headquarters of the military commanders was in the fort of the respective unit, in this case in Arabona, Yur. The establishment of Roman towns was an important step in the infrastructural development of a province. On the one hand, we should mention the towns, Colonia, founded, founded uh, through the settlement of military veterans with Roman citizenship, which should be distinguished from the municipia created from the former civitas centers by granting them urban status and mainly inhabited by the indigenous population who mainly had peregrinus status. In the same way, we must keep in mind certain chronological stages within the process of urban uh, development, since the towns founded during the reign of various emperors affected different parts of Pannonia. During the Julio Claudian dynasty, only colonnae were founded, which were located in western Pannonia along the Amber Road running north south. Under the Flamian emperors, Municipalization primaries affected southern Pannonia, namely the Drava, Sava, Danube, Interfluve, where both coloniae were founded and settlements were raised to the rank of municipium. It was during the reign of Trajan then in Pannonia and at the same time in the Imperium Romanum it itself, the last colonia were established with the deductio settlement of veterans, which again only affected the area of southern Pannonia. Although colonia were still established in Pannonia later, these were no longer towns founded by the settlement of veterans, but by granting certain municipia the title of colonia, which was a higher rank in greater prestige. It was during the reign of Emperor Hadrian that the first settlements along the Danubian frontier were given the rank of municipium, and as a result, the process of urban development in the border region also commenced. It is noticeable that all the towns of Hadrian's era were founded near the forts of Legion stationed along the Danube frontier. In the Severan era, the, we only have information about the elevation of former municipia to the rank of colonia. This period also marks the completion 
of the municipalization process. In this context, it should be mentioned that the province of Pannonia also consisted of two parts, sometimes between uh, 103 and 107, still during the reign of Trajan, Upper Pannonia, Pannonia Superior, was established in the west, and Lower Pannonia, Pannonia Inferior, in the east. In the former province, three regions were stationed in Vindobona, Vienna, Carnuntum, Petronel, Bad Deutsch Altenburg, and Brigetio Comarum Sön, and the governor, Legatus Augusti Legionis, who also held the office of legionary commander, had its, his seat in Carnuntum. The center of Lower Pannonia was established in Aquincum, Budapest, where a legion was already stationed around that time and its commander also became a governor with the rank of a praetor, legatus Augusti pro praetore. Consequently, the former civilian settlements of Aquincum and Carnutum uh, were, uh, were the two provincial seats, and legionary forts were established, became towns that gained the rank of a municipium. The Flavian era, represents a significant period concerning the fortification of the Danubian frontier, Ripa, or uh, Limes, as it will be referred uh, to here and after. At, the time, at that time, a chain of multiple fortresses were constructed along the Danube. Some, some of them were newly created uh, military fortifications, the earliest building phase of which goes back to the reign of the Fa Flavian dynasty. As we can see, the initial line of defense established earlier in the southern part of the province gradually moved northwards from the time of Claudius. Apart from some fortresses located along the northern section of the Danubian border, which already existed in the earlier phase, it can be said that the dense interconnected chain of military fortifications, including legendary fortresses and auxiliary castella, was established in the late as late as the Flavian era, between 69 and 96. It was under the emperors of the Flavian dynasty that, as we have seen above, both the municipalization of the province and its military occupation made great progress, not to mention the fact that the organization of the province was also completed during that time. By the end of the uh, AD 1st century, the linear defense of, the, of Pannonia was completed. In the middle of the second century, many military forts were reconstructed in stone. The auxiliary forts were surrounded with stone walls, which is why they even survived the turbulent period of the Marcomannic Wars. Around AD 200, further stone buildings were erected, but there is still evidence of the existence of timber-built barracks. The two legionary fortresses, Brigatio and uh, for above mentioned Aquincum, located in the area of present day Hungary, were built in stone in the early second century. The difference between them is that Brigatio, the stone fortress, was newly built with no previous timber and earth construction, whereas in Aquincum, an already existing timber and earth fortress was replaced with a stone one. Additionally, the importance of Pannonia with its uh, 30 military forts, including four legend of fortresses, and a huge military contingent stationed on its territory for the safety of Italy and Rome, was re revealed not only during the wars started against the Marcomanni and Quadi under the reign of next emperor Marcus Aurelius, 161-180, but also in the entire crisis period of the 3rd century AD. The wars were continued and successfully concluded by Commodus, the son and successor of Marcus Aurelius. After this crisis, the entire defense system of Pannonia was reorganized. The fortifications of the military forts were rebuilt. The horses who shaped corner towers, uh, slightly projecting from the plain of the fort was emerged probably as early as the reign of Commodus. The fortifications that still had a timber, or timber and earth structure were rebuilt in stone. There is also evidence that for tactical reasons, oriental units were stationed in the Panini forts of Intercisa, Ulcisia Castra and At Flexum. At the same time, a type of fort previously unknown in this region appeared in Pannonia, 
namely the watchtower, Burgos in Latin language. According to the testimony of 16 building inscriptions, one of them under the picture, some of uh, which survived intact, these watchtowers, Burgi, and smaller fortlets, Presidia, were all newly established, a solo extructa in Latin, and suitable places per loca opportuna, south of Aquincum, in the territory of Pannonia Inferior between 183 and 85 during the reign of Commodus. The key, key position in a term of geo and military politics and power that Pannonia had in the vicinity of Italy and Rome became commonplace in the Roman literature of the 30th century. 3rd century. Similar to the literature of the Roman Republic uh, preceding the Roman conquest, this region was called again Illyricum. However, in this period, this term generally indicated the Danubian provinces that belonged to a large Illyrian custom district called the Publicum Portorium Illyrici. The 3rd century political history of Pannonia can be reconstruct reconstructed as follows. In Sirmium, the town located in South Pannonia at the node of major communication routes by the Danube that became an imperial seat anew in the 3rd century, some members of the senatorial political group got repeatedly engaged in the power politics of, Roman Empire, of the Roman Empire and could rise as high as the imperial throne. Likewise, the military generals of knightly rank who led victorious campaigns against the Goths near uh, the lower Danube Danube and often came from Illyricum and were in fact many times born in Sirmium itself would also become emperors. Although some rulers like Probus started reforms, there was only one of the 24 emperors over this half a century who did not die a violent death. His successor, Caesar Galerius, who was co-emperor to Diocletian, had a large channel, Fossa, the so-called Shio channel, dug the con contact, connect uh, Lake Balaton and the river Danube. During the first tetrarchy, Pannonia Superior and Pannonia Inferior were not simply renamed Pannonia Prima and Pannonia Secunda, but were split into further parts of provinces in several stages. In the southern part of former Pannonia Superior in the area south of the Drava was the province of Savia. The north of this was the province renamed Pannonia Prima. In the north, that is in the area of former Pannonia Inferior, between the Danube and Lake Balaton, the province of Valeria was established, while south of it there was Pannonia Secunda. In the fourth century, a threefold defense system was established in Pannonia and the adjacent territories. The first line in the east was represented by the system of ramparts and ditches in Sarmatia, in the Barbaricum. It lay outside the territory of the Imperium Romanum and was also defended by Roman outposts built in the Barbaricum. The second line was along the Danubian frontier, which was defended from the reigns of Diocletian and Constantine the Great, and as far as the section along, along the Danube band north of Aquincum is concerned, particularly from the reign of Valentinian I onwards, with new and rebuilt military establishments. The third line of defense ran inside the province. It was the so-called chain of inner fortresses. Without exception, these fortresses were located in the hinterland of the frontier at the nodes of major routes as supply bases, which were meant to provide the necessities for the military units stations stationed along the limes. These forts were fundamentally Similar, similar, but sometimes differed considerably from each other in the detail of uh, floor plan, size and defenses, the side, corner and gate towers projecting from the wall. They were established in the late Roman period, the fourth century. The section of the Danubian frontier north of Aquincum between Estergom and Santendra was the most fortified part of the entire Roman Empire in the late antiquity. This border section was defended by densely aligned forts, fortlets, and watchtowers. In the fourth century AD, mainly during the reigns of Valentinian I, his brother Valens, and his son Gratian, uh, 
The limits of immense military importance was strengthened with seven major forts and 43 fortlets, including several watching towers. Fortifications were also constructed at smaller or larger, larger distances from each other in the area of the Barbaricum on the left bank of the Danube. In this regard, we must mention the bridgeheads and fortified posts. Now coming, we, uh, we are coming to some uh, monuments, some remains of Roman art in Pannonia. The presence of high quality works of uh, Pannonian towns and centers, such as Savaria and Aquincum, is not particularly surprising. Nevertheless, due to finds that came to light in the last two or three decades, we needed to gradually reassess the quality of works of art produced in minor settlements or villa estates located in the interior of the province and towns established near military centers, and even those discovered in the military forts themselves. In the following, the most impressive works of fine arts will be presented, which considerably contributed to this change of view and attest the presence of high, light, uh, high, uh, high quality Roman art, even in a province located by the northern eastern frontier. According to our current knowledge, Colonia Claudia Savaria, Sombate, my native city actually, situated at the so-called Ember Route, from Carnuntum to Aquileia, northern Italy. It was uh, one of the most prosperous towns in Pannonia. This explains why about 2,000 mosaic floor fragments have been discovered in, its, in this uh, area. The most widely known and also perhaps one of the most important of them is a richly decorated mosaic floor of the late Roman governor's palace. The murals of the so-called octagonal building near the governor's palace, which uh, has, uh, have been preserved in situ, are also of great uh, significance, I mean the wall, pa wall paintings. The high quality wall paintings of the Iseum were made considerably earlier, namely in the Flavian period. One of these depicts a, a priestess of, Is of Isis and the other shows a garland. The building inscription on the facade of this temple together with the decorative reliefs has also, uh, has also become too light. In Savaria, the fragments of the colossal sculptures belonging to the capital triad should also be mentioned. A similar group of statues is known from the city of Skarbancia, from the Ember Road, where the altars of an Isis uh, temple, some parts of the forum, as well as some statue plinths partly used as the basis of equestrian statues, have been discovered as well. Likewise, the walls of the late Roman fortification of Skarbancia have largely survived. In terms of fine arts, Aquincum has uh, such high, standing, uh, high standard works that corresponds to its rank and its place among the settlements in Pannonia. In Aquincum, both in the public and private sectors, mosaics and various, uh, of various designs have survived. One of the best known mosaic floors, the central image field of uh, which depicts the scene where Dejanera is abducted by the Kentaur Nessos, comes from the third century Hercules Villa, a house decorated with both wall paintings and sculptures, which probably stood in the prestigious neighborhood of the Aquincum military town. From the er, uh, other figure uh, representations decorating the mosaic floor, a winged arrows holding a huge bunch of grapes and a tigress also uh, worth mentioning. In the northeastern part of Aquincum military town in today's Bouvar and Foyambur street, the remains of a third century dwelling house, Domus, were discovered. The building was decorated with mosaic floors, multi-layered frescoes, found in situ in some rooms, and stuccos with plant, figural, and architectural motifs. The central tract of the large stone building is represented by an elaborately ornamented wing. The base of the walls, having a terrace of floor with decorated, decorated with buras, imitating green and red marble, and a light background divided into small units by black lines. The walls in room number 20 were decorated with the imitation of marble at the base, as well as uh, with an animal figure, the famous stork, and a curtain motif. 
In connection with the canopy, uh, mention should be made of the mosaic decoration of the governor's palace. A considerable portion of the rooms in the currently known part of the palace were decorated with, mo were decorated with mosaics. These include black and white motifs made of basalt and limestone species laid in a styli uh, styli stylized heart-shaped pattern arranged in a square, square grid, as well as an in intricate mandar pattern composed of black grains on a yellow background arranged in a diamond-shaped grid. The most impressive part of the bath house belonging to the palace is room uh, number 63, decorated with little black and red stones with figurative scenes and a white background and the mosaic floor of which shows an idyllic scene of the sea. The bath house connected to the eastern side of the Extramula Inn, in the Deversorium, near to the southern town walls is a remar remarkable building. It was excavated in 1994, and under its rubble layer, fragments of a, a contiguous wall painting uh, depicting plants, motifs, and figures scenes were discovered. Finally, among the early Christian monuments of Aquincum, special mention should be made of a three-lobed early Christian chapel, Cella Trihora, and a painted slab covering a burial chamber. High standard monuments of early Christianity period are nevertheless primarily known from the town of Sopiane, Page in southern Pannonia. The burial chambers with the depictions of the apostles Peter and Paul, as well with the scenes of Adam and Eve, and liturgical objects such as a jar are the most known, uh, renowned uh, ones. The wall paintings discovered in the city of Brigetio and representing previously unthinkably high standards soon gained international fame. Fragments of the first mural with a major contiguous surface, which belonged to the so-called painting, painting room from the second half of the sec second century AD, were unearthed during a rescue excavation carried out in 1960. The uh, ten myth mythological scenes uh, could be reconstructed, which were rep represented in a small square-shaped pattern on the side walls. The scenes included, for example, the judgment of Paris, Judicium Paridis, or the meeting of Mars with Ilia and the she-wolf breastfeeding Romulus and Remus. In some cases, the fragments of painted inscriptions associated with the representations have also remained. Additionally, the last three decades also saw major discoveries in the civil town of Brigetio. Between 1994 and 96, partially interconnected fragments of a painting were discovered, which could be dated to the first half of the third century. A wooded ceiling of a dining room, a tablimun, was decorated with a, pos a painted cosmological, cosmological scene. In the middle, a circular composition comprised a pair of fixed stars, Andromeda and Pegasus, the horse, whereas in the four corners of the ceiling, the personifications of the four seasons, the um, spring, summer, autumn, and winter could be seen in the form of female busts. Another similarly impressive wall painting was unearthed in a neighboring house. It shows servants in four fields and animal pelts, here lioness, depicted uh, alternatively with them. One of the figures wearing military boots and a white long-sleeved tunica, tunica manicata, decorated with uh, crimson stripes and interpreted as palmarine soldiers with uh, the greatest uh, likelihood. Holds a silver tray with baby leeks, the spring onions, after Martialis porus capitatus, on it, while the other servants has a straight-sided bronze vessel in his hand. Finally, we need to mention the exceptionally high-quality mosaic from floors of the Palazzo Villa Estate, which shows figures in scenes, pheasants and doves, and other figurative motifs like a cantaros here. 
The mosaic floors, together with high standard wall paintings, decorated the living rooms and dining rooms of the villa. In the peristyle of the villa, an idyllic wall painting representing a garden scene with fruit trees and a bee eater was also discovered. I'm coming to the end of the Roman Empire and of my paper. The foreign ethnic groups, the Gantes, who settled in the province between uh, 380 and 470, got into close contact with local Romanized population and ancient culture. Accordingly, it can be presumed that the culture and population of the Roman province continued up to the uh, late 5th and early 6th century, even if the presence of the Roman administration cannot be evidenced after 455. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Borghi, for the lecture. We are approaching the end of this ceremony. As a closing segment of the event, please join me in listening to Ferenc Farkas' students' for songs from Potok, performed by the Pro Musica Corps of the Institute of Arts, Communication and Music. The composer, Ferenc Farkas, tended to be inspired by the Hungarian musical tradition, and many of his pieces incorporate adaptations of its most beautiful tunes. The following three movement choral music comprises student songs taken from the 18th century songbooks, also known as Melodiaria, composed in reformed colleges of the Kingdom of Hungary. The first movement is a lyric love song. The second is a cheerful dance in minuet rhythm. The final movement is a vigorous drinking song. The conductor, once again, is Associate Professor Ákos Erdős. Please welcome the Pro Musica Mix Score.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Pro Musica uh, mix core. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. With this, we conclude the opening ceremony of the 28th annual meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. I would like to extend my gratitude to everyone for the attendance and the attention. The evening, however, does not end just yet. I would like to invite you all to the welcome reception in the garden of the Hungarian National Museum. The reception begins at half past seven. Reaching the museum takes only half an hour of walk via the Elizabeth Bridge, where you will be presented a marvelous view of Budapest on both banks of the river Danube. On the other hand, you can choose the bus lines number 5 and 110 at Dobrente there, just outside this venue. Both lines take you to the Astoria station adjacent to the university and the museum. Have a nice evening, a great stay in Budapest, and enjoy the conference. Thank you.